All right, welcome everybody to the University of Idaho and Montana State University uh, Fall Professional Education Series. This is our third presentation of five. The next time we're here, I believe, is October 30th, where um, Brad Aker and, my, and me will be presenting on uh, commissioning and some of the challenges of getting stuff to work. And um, so, and before that, we've got next week two, two events, uh, the Better Bricks Awards on Wednesday evening, the 22nd, and then the Energy Conference, the 22nd through the 25th down here in Boise, and then there's actually the Sustainability Conference up in Sun Valley, if any of you are up there, uh, check that out. But without further ado, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, Northwestern Energy, Idaho Power, and Better Bricks for bringing uh, Professor Chuck Eastman to us from Georgia Tech tonight. Uh, Professor Eastman is going to be presenting on building information modeling and the role of performance analysis in that frame. He's the, one of the leading researchers in the area. We're really fortunate to have him here tonight. Um, previous to Carnegie Mellon, uh, Professor Eastman was at UCLA and, or excuse me, previous to Georgia Tech, he was at UCLA and Carnegie Mellon. Um, background is all in architecture. His degrees are in architecture. His research focus has been in the realm of computer-aided design. Um, Energy, uh, energy database or uh, engineering databases, uh, cognitive thinking relative to design, and, and therefore the computer interface, um, and more recently with the development of building information modeling. With that, I will turn it over to you, Chuck. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to mention my book. Yes, the your book, book Building Information <laughs> Handbook, yeah. Modeling Handbook. Yeah. Yes, it, it's uh, a great resource. Doing the best of all the building information modeling yeah. books. It's a Wiley gonna, book. I'm going to leave it up here so you can all copy the, the really tricky title down. BIM yeah. handbook. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, building information modeling is uh, transforming how practice is being undertaken, uh, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Uh, we've all lived a life thinking that drawings were the representation of buildings, but 25 years from now, they will be reports off of a model, but they really won't be the source of information uh, for very many buildings. So what I'd like to do is talk today, uh, give a little bit of background about what building information modeling is and why it is transforming the industry. and. Then number two, about the projects that I've been doing, mostly with GSA. I have uh, three different research projects, but uh, two, two, two lines of work are through GSA at the national level, and uh, I'll, I'll report on those. Uh, it really is a revolution. You know, the, the uh, manufacturing industries realized in the 1980s that if they modeled the product in the computer before they modeled it, before building it, that they could virtualize many aspects of design analysis, simulation, operations, production planning, and everything else. And they've been doing that. You look at Boeing, you look at General Motors, not doing so well right now, but, uh, but all the, Toyota <laughs> and, and all the successful uh, automobile country, companies also. Uh, manufacturing like General Electric, they're modeling their products in the computer, have been doing it for 10, 15 years at least. Actually, the technology for doing modeling buildings in the computer in the same way that manufacturing was done uh, is, has been around since the 1970s also. It developed in parallel. I was part of that. But then AutoCAD and electronic drafting came along in the 1980s and just drowned out the efforts of doing 3D modeling in buildings. It was expensive, it was slow, it wasn't as reliable. Uh, but there were uh, production, and there were some old systems, something called RUCAPS in the UK, other systems, Sonata was a child of, uh, of the RUCAPS people. Uh, and there's been a whole line of 3D production-oriented uh, building uh, modeling tools uh, since the 1970s. But just now, in the last, uh, six, seven years have, have they really uh, taken place. Now that's a huge revolution because it has, that, it has impacts on all the users of 
of drawings. It has impacts on the owners and operators. It has uh, building codes, insurance companies, all the subcontractors. Subcontractors have been using BIM longer than architects have. Actually, architects are a little bit behind the curve in the use of 3D modeling. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that, I think. So what is the basic idea of a building information modeling? If I build a model of the building, this is the Merck uh, Research Labs in, in Boston in the center here, uh, in the computer before I uh, build it in reality and then produce drawings off of that, I can guarantee a consistent set of drawings. I will challenge anybody with a $10 million building that I will find inconsistencies in those. The windows won't be consistently placed, and dimensions will be inconsistent. Why? Because it's all been managed by a person manually. And nobody can handle that amount of information without making errors. So there's a little bit of, of improvement there. How many people on a construction site, or how many owners and occupiers can read a set of construction drawings before it's built? Very few. Uh, you talk to construction management, and there's two or three people on a construction site that can read the drawings and they give instructions to everyone else. On the other hand, if I have a 3D model, everyone can really understand it. You can walk them through the building, walk them through the construction tasks in the morning, and they'll understand what they're supposed to be doing and what the intentions and cont contingencies are in other aspects like that. And of course, the owners can understand what's in the hung ceiling, why the, ceiling, the plenum has to be deeper or not deeper, and all those other issues because they can see it because there's a 3D model showing it. So everybody understands the building much better. We have to understand that construction documents are arcane coded documents that few people will understand and fewer and fewer will be able to produce in the future because they won't be needed. I'm taking a longer term perspective, of course, in all of this for 10, 15 years. Clash detection already is saving large amounts of money in, uh, in construction. Uh, fabrication level models, if they're done in 3D, uh, putting it together in, on, in the uh, computer, having clash detection meetings, either virtual ones or physical meetings, and getting rid of all of those uh, inconsistencies before uh, building it in, in reality can save 15 or 20 percent of certain construction costs, particularly the MEP subcontracts. There's been documented cases of 15 percent, 20 percent savings on the MEP level. MEPs usually not even laid out in detail uh, because they don't know where everyone else, because everybody's been doing it in 2D, they do single line, center line drawings, the ductwork, uh, the running out of electrical chases. Uh, the, uh, the fire con control systems and all of that. So they take all their equipment, they go out to the construction site, they figure out where everybody else is, and then they route their stuff in place. Doing it in a, la in a shop, prefabricating it, because they know where everybody else is, is, has laid their work out. They can produce it faster, there's less waste, there's fewer people on the construction site, therefore more safety. These are all benefits of thinking in a slightly different way. And this is being, being done. Over half the firms in the, in the country say that they are using BIM, architectural firms. About 40% of the construction companies say they're using BIM. Uh, McGraw-Hill's got a new survey that's just coming out now that will have the current results for this year. It's a fairly elaborate dealing with architects, uh, contractors, and fabricators. It'll be very interesting to see what the current status is. Uh, uh, for us, uh, certainly doing a design and performance analysis. Uh, I was talking with Kevin um, uh, earlier today about, uh, about uh, validating, both validating analysis and running analyses more often so that you could do run analysis for energy usage or light, uh, sunlighting or cost estimation on a weekly basis or even more frequently to understand how your decisions are impacting those performance variables. That isn't the only aspects of design. I'm not saying that quantitative information is the only criteria, not at all. But uh, instead of waiting till the end of the design or very far downstream and then checking these, uh, we really could be doing them frequently and tracking how our decision make making is affecting design and, and costs and performance. 
I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about uh, what parametric modeling is. I haven't, and, and, the, and the basic technology. Uh, p building information modeling is really the parametric modeling that's been developed in manufacturing in the 1980s. A company called ProEngineer uh, uh, came online in 1987. Uh, it, Pro, Pro Engineer is the two, excuse, isn't the company is isn't the company name. That's the product name. The company's name was Parametric Technologies Corporation (PTC), and they're still a very large company. Uh, and now, uh, certainly, uh, Katia, uh, SolidWorks, uh, Autodesk, Inventor, uh, IronCAD. There's a lot of parametric m modeling. Uh, uh, systems out there in the manufacturing industries. Manufacturers, they don't have a line of product that they build custom ca CAD systems for. So, so they build a model of their product. The model of their product is to parameterize the geometry and the, and the functionality of it uh, according to the way they know the rules should be set. Uh, the difference between their models and the, uh, and the building information models is that we have a predefined set of objects in the, in the BIM tools, walls, floor slabs, windows, doors, and other such. But they're defined by a set of rules developed by uh, Revit software developers or Bentley software developers or ARCHICAD software developers that they think characterizes uh, the behavior of the 3D models. When I say behavior of the 3D model, I mean as you update or modify something, it automatic, those rules apply and automatically correct. Just like stretching walls, I can take a grid line, I can change the uh, column layouts, I can change the length of the columns, I can update the connections. All of that will, can be done, will be done automatically in a, in a structural BIM tool or architecturally in an architectural BIM tool. So that, uh, I and others worked in 3D modeling for a long time, but making changes was still complicated and laborious until the rule-based updates, which is what building information modeling is, was, uh, was incorporated in the tool. So th that's what's provided by Revit, Bentley Architecture, ARCHICAD, and so forth. So, that, so when I embed those rules into a product, I'm embedding the behavior uh, of those, how I want those, uh, those objects to behave, whether in this case, these are the connect connection details out of a tool called Tecla that will automatically do, do the connection detailing for steel fabrication or precast concrete fabrication. Uh, other kinds of engineering knowledge or design knowledge. I'm doing some experimental work for a New York uh, company, it's not one of those funded projects at this point in time, to do high-rise building service course. Stairways, elevator patterns, uh, uh, mechanical room, vertical duct space, so that they can design envelopes of buildings and we can plop down a service core that will correspond to the square footage and re rental uh, space requirements uh, for the building. And it will automatically adjust the number of floors, floor to floor height, and all of that as it's changed. So, and there's other work going on in hospital rooms and, and other kinds of sp spaces where there's critical relationships and non-critical relationships, so you can build those rules in also. So embedding design knowledge is a fundamental capability of these BIM tools. And one of the things that we're trying to teach all students coming out of, in, of architecture schools is how to embed those rules as, as embedding nine, uh, design knowledge into the BIM tools. So embedding knowledge is a big aspect. And it's a way that companies will differentiate themselves. It will be ways in which um, uh, firms will be able to take the one person who's an expert in some area and take that expertise possibly and be able to distribute it to the other users in the company. Of course, doing cost estimation out of bills of material and, uh, and then automatic scheduling. There's a, a growing number of software packages that tie in with BIM tools that allow this to be done also, both at the architecture side and at the, on, on the fabricator and construction side. So the current uses of 
building information modeling is, is open-ended. I want to emphasize that. The previous set, set of applications are those that are really uh, usable today. We're still working to make the interfaces for uh, different kinds of analysis smooth and transparent. And all of these require the proper assignment of, of uh, properties and attributes and proper kind of setting up of, of your building model so that these analyses can be done. So there's a kind of discipline. In architectural drawings, you can say, well, if it looks right, it's right. It can look right in a BIM model, and it, it won't necessarily be right because of the attributes, the structural relationships, the topological ways things are connected and things that, uh, that aren't quite so visible. And, uh, and there's a big learning curve involved in that. Uh, I don't know if there's been much work in laser scanning uh, here, uh, but in, in other parts of the country, uh, we're seeing uh, retrofit projects where uh, using laser scanning and point clouds, using Leica and other kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cloud point generators, and then coming in and converting those to BIM models for as-builts. Uh, there's some, a whole set of hard issues to resolve I know Salt Lake City, there's a laser scanning company. I, I visited them a while back. I, I don't know if there's any in this area. Uh, that uh, for uh, converting the uh, uh, cloud of uh, points into a 3D model, uh, that's still a, an interactive and, and largely manual task. But, uh, but there is some work going on in automating that conversion. And that would greatly uh, benefit uh, the uh, retrofit work. Uh, design for fabrication, uh, certainly uh, Gary Technologies and uh, Norman Foster and other companies have uh, been de uh, developing uh, very unusual building uh, uh, forms uh, and uh, work a little bit at certainly making those uh, uh, producible, but uh, managing them in the way that uh, uh, really makes them economical to fabricate and manage the fabrication process, there's still a gap. We have excellent tools for fabrication level modeling, ductwork, sheet work, piping systems, steel fabrication, structural steel fabrication, uh, precast concrete fabrication, using standard technologies. And then there's this other design for fabrication work uh, going out in, in the innovative design area. And there's a, a kind of gap between those that we're still working at uh, bringing together and uh, and providing a smooth uh, tr a transition. Uh, the uh, but we're going to see more. This is a this is a NC tool for cutting and drilling of, of steel, large steel fabrication shops. There's a big one in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, uh, P and W. What, I forget there. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, that's, they, I think this photograph was actually taken from their shop. Uh, there's a guy named Mark Holland, who's, a, who's the uh, vice president for engineering there, that uh, uh, is very active in the AISC and in automation. Uh, the steel industry, starting in the 1990s, had 3D modeling tools, uh, really taken from the, from the manufacturing parametric modeling uh, technologies. So that uh, for, for 10 years, they've been uh, building 3D models for structural steel to do the fabrication, cutting, uh, taking, uh, doing the uh, laser and uh, plasma cutting of, of all the plates, bring the steel in on the rear, hand, rear end side, automatically cut it, drill it, uh, do the copes for the, the flange to flange uh, uh, joining, and uh, uh, everything except the assembly. And, uh, a l sometimes they do some uh, uh, NC welding, but it's almost all bolted uh, assemblies at this point in time. But uh, they've been doing uh, NC fabrication, precast concrete's been doing, um, doing 3D modeling. Uh, certainly, you must have a, have a uh, off a Home Depot or, uh, or Lowe's here. Uh, if you've ordered kitchen cabinets, you can get them back all produced custom to your specifications in 10 days. How do you think they do that? They have an NC shop. If you've been to a large cabinet 
kitchen cabinet place. It's all NC cut. It's all uh, automatically laid out on panels. Uh, they even uh, do the production planning off of the plans that, or the model that you submit from the Lowe's or Home Depot. They're a very early uh, NC integrated process. Uh, one of the important aspects I think that, uh, that uh, is a potential for architectural design is, uh, is simulating users in the uh, a facility and trying to improve and address the performance aspects of the facility from a, a user perspective. Uh, uh, certainly uh, airports, uh, transit stations, hospitals, uh, simulation modeling for, th for these kinds of buildings already uh, can be done, but it's very expensive, it's very tedious, it's very uh, 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 unusual to do in standard projects. Finding ways of, uh, of uh, reducing these costs, uh, automating uh, parts of the uh, setup and planning for them are projects that are going on. And, and this will all be facilitated by BIM. I'm laying out things that don't exist today that I, I'm projecting will exist in the next uh, five or 10 years because BIM makes them all possible. So these are kind of what I'm calling near-term uh, payoffs. I talked a, l a little bit about uh, prefabrication of, uh, of uh, uh, mechanical systems. There's been some very innovative projects in California and in the UK where they prefabricated large assemblies of mechanical equipment, especially in hospitals, and then just go out and install them. Have the trucks in just in time delivery. Uh, don't set them on the site at all. Install them right into the building. Uh, very, very fast, very, very error-free. Uh, a very, uh, an area where there's typical uh, safety issues in construction uh, and, uh, and being done in, in a, May the, the site looks like a, like a factory floor almost. There's nothing, uh, there's equipment and things aren't stacked on the site. Uh, the International Code Council uh, is following the lines of what Norway and, uh, and Singapore have done. Singapore has online uh, uh, code checking for some sections of the code and has had it for a couple of years uh, using uh, building information modeling output uh, as the basis. The International Code Council is the U, it sounds international, it's mostly US. It's the master code for all the subsidiary codes in the country. And they have uh, some demonstration projects uh, online today. You can put in some, uh, I think the electrical code, uh, or at least some sections of it, and ADA uh, circulation and accessibility checking are available in limited forms. And those, I think, will be distributed for, uh, for automated use in the not distant future. And they're working on other sections of the code also. So these are parts of the breadth of issues that are uh, poten possible that could never be practically thought of if the basis was electronic drawings. Because only people can read electronic drawings. There's still text, there's still lines, there's still not objects. The objects don't have attributes, they don't have, have uh, you, do, you can't do a piece count off of a, uh, automatically off of a set of drawings. Somebody has to go in and count, figure out what is a net unit to count. So all of these things uh, are, are tremendously changed when we uh, uh, take this route. So some of the automatic checking. Uh, in this line, as you probably are aware, uh, starting in 2007, GSA required all projects to be BIM enabled to some level. It's a very minimal level. Uh, the minimal level is that they, there's a pro I, I have some slides I'll show you a little bit later. They have a very general development process that's, that's uh, presented to, uh, certainly to the architects and the, and the local district offices that manage the projects throughout the country. Uh, and, uh, and the requirement that all uh, GSA projects have is that they have to be able to validate the uh, spatial areas within the building uh, so that they can be checked automatically. It's just at, at, at concept design level. So room layouts, doors, windows, uh, kind of just a really 3D floor plan layout of the building uh, has to be done in 3D in BIM uh, so that this checking can be done. That's, that's across. Now we're adding another one for courthouses that's uh, it's still a voluntary uh, aspect. 
And, the, uh, and this is called series six. The uh, uh, f uh, spatial validation is called series two. And this is for circulation design and validation of courthouses. Uh, this, we started on this in 2007 uh, uh, because uh, circulation layout in courthouses is, is a, a major issue. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the uh, GSA is, is the real estate agency for the federal government, and they manage and own they, they manage and own uh, the, the government buildings, and then they're leased by uh, the U.S. courts, uh, health, health and welfare, uh, social security, all the other government agencies. So the government agency that you, uh, lives in uh, federal courthouses is the U.S. courts. The, not the Justice Department and the executive branch, but the, but the, the, the courts uh, itself. So uh, primarily occupied by federal uh, judges, uh, courts of appeals, and, and so forth. Uh, also U.S. Marshals Office obviously exists in, in federal courthouses also, so they're also an uh, inhabitant. Uh, the U.S. courts uh, over a period of time has collected uh, its best practices in called the U.S. Courts Design Guide, a 400-page document of, uh, of, of issues. One of the major issues in court house layout is that there's three separate circulation patterns. One for judges and uh, juries and the internal staff called restricted space, of course the public areas, and then the secure space for defendants and, uh, and uh, the uh, U.S. Marshals. So the, those three circulation paths are only to intersect at certain points. Certainly the courtroom is where they come together. There's a couple of other spaces. Uh, U.S. attorneys have some access to restricted space as well as public space. There's, uh, the the uh, U.S. Marshals also have some uh, uh, special uh, situations where you may have a prisoner block and the pub certain subsets of the public, like relatives, can visit prisoners in the court. In, in, at the interface between secure space and public space. So there's some very specific interfaces. All of those have to be very well managed in the design as well as in operations. So uh, we uh, were asked to automate the design reviews. We went in and looked at the, uh, for uh, circulation and security, we went in and looked at the, uh, uh, carefully examined, parsed, and put into a database, the US Court's design guide and then found uh, 94 paragraphs dealing with, uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with circulation issues. Uh, we found 302 different circulation issues at different levels of aggregation. Some, some of them said in U.S. Courts of Appeal, this kind of condition must exist. In other cases, they said all courtrooms uh, in grand jury sp uh, spaces. Uh, which isn't a courtroom, it's a, another kind of space. Uh, so some of these were high level and applied to whole subsets of spaces. Some of them applied to uh, a, a, a subset of those spaces. And so that we had to parse and build a hierarchy of space classifications so that we could uh, analyze these and, and apply them correctly. Uh, so one paragraph might apply, generate many, many circulation issues. So we parsed all of this, developed a, a, a rule base. Uh, the rule base is a set of uh, parametric structures, uh, six of them, that can define uh, these different circulation rules. Some of them require all access paths that have to go through a security gate, for example, from the outside to the public. In others, there has to be at least one access path that is secure from for example, the, the sally port, which is the entrance where uh, prisoners are brought in uh, to, uh, to a holding cell. Uh, and so there's a secure route. But it doesn't apply to all routes. It just ha there's, there's one that's designated. So th there's uh, some different logical conditions. Some of them have to, be done on, have to exist on the same floor. Some of them can go up and down elevators. Uh, different kinds of conditions. Sometimes there's width conditions or, or spacing conditions also. So we developed a set of, uh, of, of uh, rule structures. 
We want to really develop a language for circulation rules, and we're working on that, but we're not there yet. So we have these kind of fixed uh, structures that we can parameterize and put different conditions in. So we, uh, first we analyze the building, extract out all the spaces. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in more detail how we, how we do that and how we analyze them. And we take that information and, uh, and the set of rules and we're using a, a, a software system called Celebri Model Checker. It's a Finnish company, a spin off from Nokia. A lot of Finnish uh, interesting software exists these days. Uh, and uh, it's the same software that's being used for the building code checking, Java based. Uh, we're, uh, we're Java developers uh, working with Celebri in developing these rule sets. Where we find errors, of course, we have to report back what part of the building, we give an image of the building, floor plan type uh, perspective, uh, and what section of the code is violated and then what the rule interpretation is. So we produce those reports. I don't think I have those examples of those reports here. Here's an example courthouse. Uh, this is the Jackson, Mississippi courthouse in, 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 in Mississippi. It's being done by H3 used to be Hardy, Holzman, Pfeiffer, but now it's a different combination of people out of New York City. Uh, it's a six-story build, building uh, plus two stories underground. It's about 390,000 square feet. Uh, these are the three zones, the public zone, the restricted zone, and the secure zone. Uh, we build a graph automatically based on the circulation uh, layout, the doors, and the space types of all spaces. Uh, and, and also going up and down stairs and, and elevators uh, so that uh, we generate all access routes and then put attributes on all those access routes. Is this public space? Is this a restricted space? Is, is there a, a lockable door? That's something we're, we're still negotiating on with the architects about defining at this stage of design. Uh, and, and, can, uh, and therefore can evaluate these uh, various rules. Uh, the 302 uh, uh, circulation rules in this building uh, turn into about 27,000 routes, and we can check all of those routes in about 15 seconds um, and, and generate reports on. This building, by the way, had lots of problems because there's, it's really two separate buildings connected with this public walkways in between. So the security issues and restricted space issues going from the left wing to the right wing were all problematic. The only secure or restricted access paths were going down to the basement, going into the secure judge's uh, parking lot and go up on the other side. So obviously they were violating the rules all the time. We got this project after CDs were we're at 95%, so it's too late to change very much. So one of the issues that came up over and over again is, Eastman, your group's finding these problems way too late. We have to move up the stream, catching them earlier, well, before changes. Are. But it was a very good project. It's still, it's in construction right now. And a uh, little H3 sign in the corner. Uh, and is, uh, is moving forward. So here's, here's examples of the kind of routes we generate. This is a judge's uh, uh, chambers. They're on the outside of the building, almost always in corner locations, where, where, where judges, the, of course, are the big wheels in the, in the courthouse. And this is uh, down in one wing, down to, uh, uh, I forget what this, I think it's a, a clerk's office or something, but the rule says that uh, this should be accessible through uh, through a restricted space, which is marked in red. Sometimes they go up and down a, a stair, and, the, and this, this shows a, a path between a, a space on one floor and another floor. So these are the kinds of diagrams that we automatically generate to show circulation where it works or where it doesn't work. It's a very funny problem. If there's no circulation path between one space and another that satisfies all the criteria, what circulation path do you show them? <laughs> It's a guess. We take the shortest path that doesn't work out of all the sets that we try, and, and we show that one. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a no-win uh, answer, but we have to kind of guess what will, 
give them a clue. Uh, here's, here's other examples. Uh, these deal with this uh, a path going uh, across the, uh, through the public space, which uh, raises lo uh, lots of problems. The ones in green are the public ones above ground. Uh, when they're in pink here, this means that this is down in the basement. So uh, th uh, there were rules about audiovisual equipment and others. Uh, audiovisual equipment sometimes is projecting, uh, uh, what do you call it, when you uh, uh, introduce artifacts or introduce information to the, to the jury. Uh, Evidence, yeah, introducing evidence uh, to the uh, to to the jury. So it's supposed to be through rict restricted space where the public couldn't grab it and run or something. I guess uh, we were we worked on a variety of uh, of uh, projects: uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, Jefferson uh, City, uh, Missouri, uh, and, and these are, are those projects. Uh, we also have worked a little bit in Austin, Texas uh, courthouse at this level. But uh, after the end of the first year, uh, we got to, this, this is a kind of a paraphrase of, of, we, of lots of issues that we got. You're finding all these errors in courthouses after the final concept has been selected. The process is, uh, the standard process is that after the architects are selected, they have to generate at least three concept alternatives. They select and, and they iterate on those some, and then one of those concepts is selected and is elaborated a little bit further. And these are where those checks were, be done, were being done, after one concept was selected, before they go into uh, design development. So late concept design is just before design development takes place. Can you apply these checks at preliminary concept design, when the initial proposals are put forward by the AE so that we can assess the different multiple candidates before we select one and fixate on it? so that they'll know the implications of these issues. And they were talking about circulation issues. Uh, being someone who's interested in, uh, in uh, uh, automation and improving the feedback, we came back and said, yes, we'd be happy to do that. We'd like to integrate that with uh, not only with, uh, with doing circulation analysis, but also integrating the spatial validation and we know that you do energy analysis and cost estimation of these alternatives. We will do all of those. So we negotiated a little bit. This is the uh, 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 Public Building Service P100 uh, design guide. And this is the process that they follow now. And it says 8.8, create three or more preliminary concepts. And then refine those concepts and then validate the BIM measurements on those concepts with the design, and that's input into the final decision. This doesn't mean that the, the selection is done. Uh, obviously, they're looking at the aesthetics, they're looking at the, uh, at the uh, uh, renderings of the building, how it fits with the context. There's a whole set of uh, historical and social context issues in the, in the design of courthouses. So this is just feeding in some of the quantitative information leading into those decisions. And obviously, there's an occupant, there's the owners, there's judges who are another level of occupant with the, uh, with the uh, U.S. courts. U.S. courts are paying the lease. Uh, U.S. courts complain a lot. They approve of a concept. When it gets developed, it comes in 20% uh, over budget or 30% over budget, and it's usually co congressional. So the only way that they can uh, uh, mandate what the cost is, so the only way they can deal with that is cut down on the space. So most of their projects come out with uh, significant less space than was originally planned. So uh, we agreed to take on uh, the preliminary concept design review. Preliminary concept design review really consists of a series of 3D departmental layout spaces, kind of 3D bubble diagrams, on slabs showing floor to floor heights, uh, and, and an exterior uh, building envelope. Uh, the, out of this comes a general uh, scoping of the, of the costs and a general energy analysis as well as a spatial validation against the program. Uh, the U.S. courts has a very strict program specification for what, how many square feet for a court, courtroom, ceiling heights, lighting levels, environmental controls. They have 
uh, all of this is spelled out in, in, in much detail. We're only dealing with little aspects of it. So basically what, we're, uh, what we've set out to do and have, uh, have about two-thirds implemented is taking models from different BIM 3D modeling tools, exporting that into something called IFC, Industry Foundation Class. Industry Foundation Class is uh, a partial ISO standard, partial because it's partway through the process, hasn't been 100%, as a public exchange standard for building information. It's trying to deal with the whole extent of building information, so it's uh, very broad. It deals with HVAC equipment. It deals with uh, uh, performance measurement uh, data exchange. It deals with building geometry data exchange, some financial data exchange. It's a very big s database schema kind of structure. But uh, uh, we've defined a very simple uh, structure for uh, this uh, both preliminary and late concept design so that uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that we discovered kind of the hard way after starting reviewing projects is uh, the preliminary concept design is only supposed to have departmental level layouts. But architects, when they're, they, they know they have enough square footage, but they don't know if the, if the actual geometry of the layout lays, allows for a good arrangement for, for example, a, a judge's chamber and his clerks and access into the judge's chamber and the conference room. So, they, so they'll lay those spaces out in detail even at this early concept design. So we were getting building, building uh, to, to evaluate the combination of the departmental layouts and detailed layouts. Some of them had walls, some of them just had sp space boundaries to space boundary. So we found all kinds of variation. We were, at first we converted these, my, my, me and my students, to, so that they all had the same structure so we could analyze them. But we have to go, so we've gone in and, and are modifying our analysis tools so that we can handle all this variation between early concept design or preliminary concept design and then incremental filling in to late concept. Because we're getting all kinds of mis... Uh, and we're trying to really support how, as best we can, how architects want to build these models in a free and easy way. But it's a give and take. It, if you have a room that says M on it, if you look around and find there's a W room about the same size, not very far away, you can figure out it's men and women. If there's one M all by itself, it's probably a mechanical room. Having computers figure this out is not, is not trivial. So we have a very well-defined space vocabulary, and one of the things that I think we're going to see as a result of our work and other people's work is when you, uh, CSI, the Construction Specification Institute, is trying to develop a, uh, a well-defined uh, naming system for building types and then spaces within building types. So that at some point in the future, you'll be able to, to uh, say, I'm doing a courthouse or I'm doing a hospital, and you'll get the room types to, to lay those out instead of making up your own abbreviations for it. So that it can be checked by code, it can be checked by for energy usage, so it'll know how to, to automatically generate the load uh, generation for those kinds of spaces and other things. This, all, all of those issues come into play here. So IFC is in the middle. We're taking that one IFC model and we're doing the space validation, the uh, circulation uh, studies that, that I reported before, a preliminary uh, energy analysis. We're using Energy Plus with a lot of defaulted data, and a preliminary cost estimation. The cost estimation is coming through a system called PACES. Uh, we're just finishing the negotiations with them because GSA is paying for it. Uh, it's, a, it's out of Boulder, Colorado. They do a lot of uh, cost estimation for uh, con congressional authorization of buildings and uh, for both DOD and Veterans Administration and other branches of government. So a typical uh, early concept design might be something like this. This is idealized at the departmental level layouts. Uh, so uh, generate a, a 3D massing. Uh, all these different colored spaces are uh, uh, departmental spaces. They have a name associated with them. And in 3D, it looks like those on the bottom. This is an easy kind of model to check. 
Uh, here's another example that uh, actually was one of the early examples we got on Jefferson uh, uh, City, Missouri. Uh, again, uh, a series of 3D spaces. Uh, here it doesn't show the slabs in between. <laughs> Uh, they're just the spaces, so it looks like they're all they're not cantilevered. It's just they they're, they're, they just uh, didn't uh, display the, the spaces here. Uh, but we also get some very complicated one. This is Toledo, Ohio, and uh, all very curvilinear, and uh, and it's even uh, worse. Uh, this is a a courtyard here, and in the middle of the that triangle, in the middle of that building, that's a six-story deep uh, courtyard. Uh, and the curvilinear energy analysis, all these, all our cost estimation and energy analysis things kind of blew up on this. <laughs> on the, didn't handle them. So we make fine facets uh, on it because uh, energy plus can't handle curves. <laughs> uh, but I don't think most energy models can. Uh, anyone, ones that use the, ge use the geometry for self-shading and other things uh, and need, need need uh, angle orientation. We produce uh, the uh, comparison of the spatial validation. This is the kind of reports that were produced uh, uh, by hand uh, previously. Uh, and uh, on the number of courtrooms, the, uh, the uh, spatial uh, requirements or the, the targeted uh, spatial areas for these and the actuals for all different alternatives. How do we deal with circulation analysis dealing with these very detailed spatial requirements uh, when we only have departmental level definitions? And especially when we don't have walls and, uh, and doors. Uh, we uh, str struggled with this when we got the, the request to do it. And what we can do is identify all the spaces that are contiguous that have the spa same uh, security level. So we can take all the blue spaces that are contiguous and group them into a set of spaces that w are at least can be accessible if they're detailed in the right way. Uh, similarly, all the public spaces that are uh, interconnected to each other, that they have an adjacent wall, uh, even though it, we don't know where the doors are going to go, but, if, but they can be detailed to be accessible. If there's an accessibility requirement between uh, one space and another and they're, and they're not in the same set and you have to go out into a public space or into a, through a secure space, well then that's obviously violated. So we can tell about out of those 302, about 143 of the circulation requirements. We can check at this stage. The other thing that turned out to be a really attractive, so we generate, so, so each of the bubbles on the right is a set of spaces. And the dotted lines are vertical circulation between those. And we have an automatic implementation that reads the floor plan that generates the sets. Doesn't do this diagram. This is for us to, to conceptually understand. Uh, and can run these circulation checks. And we're writing a program that takes the detailed definitions of all these circulation rules and automatically generates the high level rules. But this is a very good way of understanding at a more conceptual level why certain kinds of circulation rules don't work. And actually, it gives a high level. There's no, you know, there's a break in your, in your, uh, in your, in your uh, restricted space uh, and, uh, and that there needs to be uh, a joining of, of, of these two zones of spaces. So it's a much more aggregate set of, uh, of criteria and, and works very well. And so, so we're planning to run this even at the later stage to give high-level overviews of why things work or do, don't work. Uh, energy analysis. At this stage of design, every courthouse is a VAV system. <laughs> that, 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 that's what they all say at the preliminary concept design. What we're really interested in is uh, building orientation, issues of atria, court. Uh, courtyards, uh, the footprint of the building, how, how it's, it's uh, oriented. Those kinds of decisions that are made at this early stage of design that set up parameters for, for detailing out the building. So we, we, Energy Plus gives us all kinds of feedback. What we're really interested in is uh, I, 
this is one of the alternatives. We're currently in a, in a process of calibrating different ways of zoning the building to get the external load distinctions. So we've got separate loads on the outside 15 feet in of the building, and we're just zoning the outside of the building with a big common core on the inside uh, in this alternative. We don't know if this is the right way of doing it. Uh, we're calibrating against uh, a very set of detailed analysis of another courthouse, and then we're going to be generating all kinds of variations of automatic zoning. It's too early for the mechanical engineers to decide how the zoning will actually be handled. They haven't selected the, a mechanical system necessarily, so we're really just trying at this early stage to get feedback to the designers about pluses and minuses against the different alternatives. So this is uh, something we're currently exploring. Uh, this is the kind of breakout that we get of the, uh, from the uh, cost estimation. It's working in a similar sort of way, but I think it's interesting. One of the good things that PACES does, PACES has a database of other projects of the same type, and to deal with inflation and variable uh, costs for different kinds of materials, Instead of generating a, a direct estimate of energy costs, what it does is it splits out for this kind of uh, building type, for the kind of parameters you give me, here is the, how much steel, structural steel will go on, here's how much uh, reinforced concrete, here's how much I interior walls, and then prices those, from those quantities, prices out the cost in a particular locality at a particular point in time. So those estimates of materials, if you change, you can go in and tweak those, uh, even at this early stage of design, and get more refined cost estimates. Uh, but you can also track those as you're actually de developing the design, and, you can, and, and that can lead you to an understanding of how, as you de develop and detail your design, it's affecting the assumptions that were made earlier. In the same way that the assumptions made earlier on energy costs as you make the actual decisions and replace that estimated value with some actual material, then those will get more and more refined. So this idea of having a tracking of your decisions and understanding the logic of your decisions as you're making them, as you go downstream. Uh, some people have called this a dashboard view of design. Uh, and uh, I think we'll, it isn't a dashboard like a, like a, uh, a, uh, speedometer, uh, but it will give you some feedback on your decisions, maybe on a weekly basis. So uh, the current status of these are that the spatial validation is operational. It was running before. We just had to uh, tune it and adjust it. We've generated some better reporting structures. The uh, circulation and security, uh, the only bugs that we're having is in the reporting structure, getting good uh, graphical visualization. Uh, that's running pretty well. Uh, we can do energy analysis on some courthouses, but some of them still blow up for our automatic uh, zoning generation, zone generation, and we haven't really calibrated the zoning in the way that, that we want to. And the cost estimate, estimation, it's a very simple interface given all the other things that we've done, but we just uh, are in the process of signing the contract jointly between GSA and, uh, and this company called EarthTech in Boulder, Colorado. So. Uh, those, these will be done this year. Uh, we're planning to distribute, the, the original goal was to distribute all of these to GSA district offices. You know, there, I think there's eight districts around the country that manage all the construction in each of the uh, different portions of the country. I know that Atlanta in the southeast is district four. I don't know what district Boise is in. Does anybody know? Three is around Chicago. Toledo, Ohio, but I don't, I don't know for the West here. Uh, that uh, they're they're the ones that do the uh, uh, preliminary reviews uh, in the district offices. But uh, I just uh, got word last week that we're going to have to change this. That they don't now that uh, GSA has ag at least agreed on the funding for the cost estimate. They don't want the district offices to have control of the cost estimation. They only want it in the central. Washington, D.C. office. So, uh, uh, our goal really is in the long run is, is to get it out into the architect's office themselves so that they can generate, use this feedback in their own design development. 
I think that's where, where the real payoff will be so that they can use the same uh, assessment uh, that, uh, that is, they're, they're being used, is being used to assess their buildings. And uh, we're, we've begun work on, on using the same kind of criteria for other building types. We've just, we started uh, last summer on a project dealing with the FDA laboratories. Completely different building type, completely different kind of rule systems than, uh, than, than courthouses, obviously. But uh, the uh, uh, FDA headquarters uh, in, near Bethesda, Maryland is building a lot of uh, new laboratories. They're adding uh, about a thousand people, new researchers a year, uh, researchers to do. Uh, it, you read about it in the papers. Uh, it's a it's a big issue with uh, all of the food testing and drug testing. And uh, we're doing an early concept design uh, assessment tool. Uh, Kling Stubbins is the architectural firm that that we're working with uh, to uh, estimate. Uh, mechanical equipment space and then mechanical equipment costs at this very early stage. Uh, from an energy standpoint, uh, all their loads are mechanical equipment. The external shell is only like 20%, they say. So that uh, we're really uh, focusing on uh, the location and layout of the mechanical equipment as a big cost variable. We're trying to understand that. While they're still working with bubble diagrams, just laying out a block of space, how much space do they need for mechanical equipment? How do, should they be using interstitial floors, put a, t put a column on the outside of the building? Uh, uh, every other uh, uh, lab module uh, ha have, a, have a, a thin wa wall of, of mechanical space that they could explore these alternatives and get some implications of the costs, uh, trade-offs from these. So that's what we're trying to develop. That's very early at this point. This all comes. And they're just working with these 3D spaces, laying them out, shoving them around uh, uh, in the same way that the US courts were do are doing it. So what I try to uh, do is both give you what people are doing now uh, using building information modeling and you know, all of the magazines. And there's 10 case studies in this book uh, from the Beijing Aquatic Center to some uh, parking garages uh, using precast concrete uh, to uh, some uh, health facilities in, uh, in California. A wide variety of case studies as well as a technical background about uh, the technology of building information modeling and perspectives from different types of people in construction. Owners, architects and engineers, general contractors and fabricators. We targeted them as uh, we have a chapter for each kind of user. So I think we'll find this technology has significant benefits for owners and, uh, and, and eliminates a lot of built-in costs in design and construction and allows much better performance to be built into architectural projects. So I think this is something whose, whose day has come. Uh, as someone who had worked in 3D parametric modeling of buildings since the 1970s, it's very exciting to me to see this all happening finally after you know, 35 years doing other things and, and waiting and, and working on the sidelines. But uh, I think we'll all see it happen in the next uh, 10 years where this becomes standard practice. Thank you. Questions. I know we must have questions for uh, Professor Eastman. Uh, Chuck, in, yeah. the, in a very complicated special use program that you showed somewhere, uh, such as uh, Max Gogan's Wang Center at Wellesley College, um, you know, Max Gogan's buildings are very dramatic, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, the interior, I found, you know, it's, the circulation is, is uh, fairly complicated and you have to go through the building two or three times in order to find your way around. Do you know if uh, building information modeling was used on that or, or if so, in a, in a single non-replicated building, would that be applicable? Well, all of these are certainly non-replicated buildings, though the building type is replicated. 
And, and one of the things that's uh, sort of unique about, uh, about the uh, courthouses is that they do have this guideline book that is, uh, is, is big and, and reasonably thorough. A one-off building uh, may not have that kind of uh, built-in reference knowledge to, to rely against. Uh, of course, Max Scoggins uh, offices are in Atlanta. Yes. Uh, we're getting with, with them well, uh, getting along, uh, and, and we're having some meetings next week on some Yale uh, building projects that he's, uh, he's doing there. So, uh, but uh, the answer, I, I know, it, he's just starting to use Revit. Uh, we did uh, the Austin Courthouse that he's uh, 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 the architect for, but uh, we did that because someone in Washington, D.C. built the 3D BIM model, and, and we were able to get that model. His office didn't produce it. So, uh, we're, he's just getting started on this. Uh, he's doing uh, through. The, uh, the Yale project is uh, uh, a masonry building uh, with, uh, with brick. And uh, we have some uh, not very nice parametric models for doing uh, 3D freeform brick walls with automatic engineering showing where reinforcing is required, where reinforcing isn't required, how you, where you have to put ties in uh, to deal with, uh, with the curvature and other things as a kind of design for fabrication. And, and he's very anxious to use it. Uh, we'll have to see. <laughs> That, that, this is a, done using something called uh, generative components as a software package and how to integrate it with Revit, I don't know how to do it. Do you think that will ultimately change the direction in which Max Scoggin goes with his design? <laughs> <laughs> don't know. You don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, what we're trying to do is facilitate what he wants to do. I don't think we're trying to pull him in another direction. So, what are some of the what are some of the big wins that folks that maybe are looking at investing into building information modeling in their professional offices can expect to see within the first six months or year? Um, what, what's working well? What's maybe a little bit further on the horizon? I know you kind of touched on that as you went through, but specifically for folks investing in the near future here, you know, the, it, it is a huge learning curve. Our education which I'm, I'm very much involved in, really is a paper-based notion of designing with uh, conceptual sketches and then adding detail. We can add detail with these BIM tools in amazing ways long before it's appropriate. I can detail out wall sections. I can do all kinds of things. And, and students have to be told, no, <laughs> you know, don't do it. So, so you really have to think. Well, it, it really uh, facilitates that detailing of building because there's a lot of detailing functionality built in. But you, but you don't, so, so it's learning how to manage uh, all the information and it's managing how you want to track the development. And I think we have very good development practices, but how to adapt it to the tool is, is a challenge. Uh, the, the, the other part is, a lot of this is really served and benefited by libraries. Even in AutoCAD, you got suites catalog libraries and, and lots of other things that you, at, at, at later stages of design, you download. Uh, I've given talks to uh, the product manufacturers, Building Product Manufacturers Association, uh, and, and I was out at uh, something called Glass Bill for the curtain wall fabricators. Uh, a week and a half ago. So, and all of these people are trying to figure out how do I build my product information so I can load it into these BIM tools. And uh, for static fixed objects, you know, toilets and s sinks and things like that, it's easy. If they're parametric, like a curtain wall or some of these Hayworth ceilings that have all kinds of edging and things around them, those are complicated and they have to build it today they have to build a Revit model, they have to build a Bentley model, they have to build an ARCHICAD model, one that works with the rule sets in each of these different software. So under, building up the libraries, training people, I think that's really the big issue. The first payoffs is a consistent set of drawings. You'll find that it's easier once you've learned how to do it, that it's easier and faster because you can make 
make a change once and it propagates to all the drawings automatically? I mean, think of that. That's, that's a huge, huge win by itself. And then walking through with the, cl with the client. The, none of these really provide highly rendered images. You still have to go to a rendering system to package to do that. But you can walk them through these uh, cruder models. They understand that they're sketch models and people can understand uh, 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 the, the aspects of, and details of the design that they couldn't before. I think another issue that people have to understand and, and develop a, 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 a strategy for is how much to model in 3D and when do you go back and just cut a section and detail it in 2D. All the tools provide that option. You know, some people just do the structural system and then go to 2D for everything else. Well, you don't have any mechanical equipment then or, or other things. Uh, so understanding that. One of the good things, as you saw in my examples, we have never had an explicit model of spaces. Even if you use most other systems, you might be able to, in ADT, architectural desktop, you can represent a wall, you can represent a stair, but you couldn't rep you didn't ever have an explicit representation of the space. You could manually draw a polyline around the wall, around uh, the edges of a wall, and, and, and calculate the area of that and call that a space. But we have 3D volumes of spaces. It's not perfectly exact. You couldn't use them for CFD, for example, because they're, st they're, they're too rough. They're, they, they take the walls where they meet the, s the slab on the floor and take that as a polygon and automatically extrude it. That doesn't quite do it <laughs> in, so, in some spaces, like uh, Max Gogan spaces. <laughs> and actually, in some of these buildings, actually, uh, the Denver Art Museum, I thought the circulation works out very, really well. And I really, I was, went, went to it just recently and, and really appreciated that. But if you get to the MIT Status Center, Yes. <laughs> Nobody can find Nobody. their way around that building. So. Plus, plus the roof leaks. Yeah, right. <laughs> Doug. It'll work. It'll work. Yeah, I got a question about uh, the systems that traditionally aren't drawn by the design team, like sprinkler systems. Mm -hmm. They're usually documented by the contractor. Yeah, right. So how to take advantage of this clash detection how does the sequence change in this system? Uh, that's, that's, an, that's a parallel line of discussion that's going on now. The new AIA contracts have made a big push into this collaborative design approach. And the uh, Open Docs contracting uh, that the AGC and, and the uh, uh, Kurt, the What's that? The Construction uh, Users Roundtable uh, have proposed uh, has something called a federated model. Uh, whether the architects do all that clash detection or the contractors do is kind of an open question right now. Because usually the, if, if, you, if you've got a collaborative project where, or design build project where the subcontractors are already part of the team, they can be doing that layout while you're finishing your construction documents. Uh, but in a design bid build, that all comes downstream from you. So, uh, and, and who's really making the, the biggest play right now? And I think uh, they're trying to take over the model building and model management business are contractors. You know, the, uh, the exam, so I'm on the AIA TAP committee that is in charge of the BIM awards. Uh, for the AIA and in, who was it? Two, it was 2005, we gave it to the Denver Art Museum, but we gave it to Mortensen Construction because Morton Construction really managed the whole BIM implementation of that for Leapskin, which uh, it, was, it, it was to state a truth uh, and, and certainly the building uh, deserved it. Uh, but it, but it also had you know, all these kind of political uh, implications. But anyway, uh, the, 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 the larger story is contractors are going ahead with BIM in a very large way at the fabrication level. All the shop models 
And so their goal is to get all the subcontractors to be qualified to do 3D modeling however they want. It has to be a 3D model uh, as to be qualified for contracting on BIM projects. And more and more contractors are pushing that. Holder Construction is a reasonable sized contractor in Atlanta who I know very well and they're doing that. Um, uh, DPR on the West Coast is uh, doing it for, uh, for the healthcare facilities. Uh, other contractors are pushing hard in that direction. So a follow up then, the question would be with the new AIA contracts that stress this integrated project delivery, are we saying that to get this to really work the best we should do that in all of our projects? Eliminate the design bid build approach and uh, I, I think there's a lot of, there are two political, big political issues. Uh, political in the sense that they're controversial, they change the way uh, we manage practice. They certainly have synergies. They, they, I think BIM promotes this collaboration and the collaboration facilitates doing building information modeling. Uh, you can do them both separately from each other, but you don't get the full benefits, I think. So it, it, it's that kind of situation. So you don't have to, but you'll get bigger successes if you do. Any other questions? One more follow-up from, from me, and, I, and again, you touched on it, but I want to stress it. Um, what would you give as the biggest caution to a firm making the transition in, uh, in terms of appropriate expectations? The first thing that uh, a firm needs to be able to do is, is to uh, get to the point where they can produce a, your, the thing that you really have to deliver as an architectural firm is a set of construction documents. So the first pass is to get to that point, be able to produce them on time, no errors, uh, in, a, in a productive way. After you've gotten to that point, then you can incrementally take on new projects uh, and maybe adding each of the steps, well, consistent drawings comes with the, with the technology. Uh, visualization comes with the technology, but exploring how to use that most effectively at the selling level and the client reviews and other stages of design, passing it out to the contractor. The issue of passing the model on to the contractor is a big issue. It's a liability issue. The, uh, the lawyers would like to tell you you shouldn't do it. They tell you that. A lot of, con a lot of the, but people are writing a lot of custom contracts that go with those models so that the contractors can use them. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, there's, and that's where the collaboration contracts begin to, uh, to, to come into play. I mean, it's one of them. Also getting good feedback. Uh, we've done uh, case studies where, for precast concrete, for steel, other kinds of things, where uh, the contractor comes in and, and justifies making big changes to the owner uh, from what was originally designed because of cost savings or speed of construction or other kinds of issues. So that kind of collaboration early really solves and smooths out those issues. You know, if the architects had the kind of input uh, in, uh, I do a lot of work with precast concrete, and uh, every project on a design, bid, build, and precast concrete gets changed around a lot uh, at, at, the, uh, at the fabrication modeling level because different plants can produce different kinds of products. and. Uh, and, and such things, so, so it, it's really varied. So understanding these things and, and beginning to explore them on a, it's a new, it's a learning curve. And you take things one at a time and try and make an incremental step and in how to use this to advantage in the business of your company, I think. Don't, I talked about a lot of things today. I kind of laid out probably a five or eight year set of issues to get there. <laughs> Good. Any more questions? All right. Well, thank you, Professor Eastman, mm -hmm. for coming out. Let's give him a round of applause.
I think you, you said a great, uh, I learned a lot about where the field is and where we're headed. Uh, I think you set a great platform for folks who are getting ready to roll up their sleeves and dig in further or dig in in the first place. So thank you for that. Um, really quickly, uh, just a reminder, um, sign in if you haven't. Uh, that helps us keep these events coming. Um, put your name and your AIA number, your professional engineering number if you need that, uh, and we can help you with CEUs. And if you don't, just get your name on the list. Um, next time we're here is October 30th, uh, back to our regular Thursday night. Uh, talking about commissioning, uh, some local buildings that we've been deeply involved with here at the lab and some, uh, some of the successes and challenges that have come from those projects. Uh, and then next week, we've got uh, Ed Mazaria coming to town to the Energy Conference, Tuesday night at the Better Bricks Awards, and Wednesday again uh, at, the Ener at the Energy Conference as a keynote. If you haven't registered and you want to attend, associationofidahocities.org. IdahoCities.org, thank you. Um, and with that, we'll close. Thanks to Idaho Power, Better Bricks, and Northwestern Energy, and for all of you coming. Cheers.